sometimes I wish I could just express to people what I wrestle with in preparing a message. You know, sometimes you feel like that the Lord has spoken directly to you. You got everything together. You know what you want to say. You know what, what you want to get across, and it's, it's, it's the way it is. And then there's times you're struggling to come up with ways to say what you know in your heart you want to say or you feel like God's saying. And it's not always easy to do. And uh, unless, you, unless you bear that kind of uh, responsibility, it's, it's, it's difficult at times to know. But I, I, I always want to say something or do something that helps or blesses you or encourage you and strengthen you. And, and um, I, I just pray that you be open to hear what the Lord is wanting to say to you through the message. Because it really doesn't matter what I say if you hear him. You all get that? You understand that? So um, today... I, I really, my heart is I want to impart something to you, uh, not just teach or preach, but impart something. In other words, I, I really want you to get, if I, one of the ways I would call it is an aha. I'd like for you to feel like that you received something from the Lord that you take with you from the service, not just something that changes your theology or the way you think or process things, but to really take something that is a tangible dimension uh, of, of the Lord uh, being imparted to you. Uh, I'm of an increased persuasion. My persuasion is, is being increased constantly that the kingdom of God is imparted. We teach the Bible, and I understand that, and I, I believe that. But an impartation, and I believe the kingdom is imparted. Jesus made a statement that you had to be born again, and I don't want to teach on impartation or kingdom necessarily, but Jesus said you have to be born again in order to see the kingdom, and you have to be born again in order to enter the kingdom. He made a statement that said through much tribulation you enter the kingdom, so in, in that context of that, I'm, I'm really more and more of increased persuasion that the kingdom of God is imparted, and that's what I'm after today. Uh, an impartation is a spiritual experience um, that, a, that, that accompanies hearing the kingdom and then receiving what it is you hear into your heart and into your life. Uh, and what I want to talk about today, I've titled this message and, and, and what I really want to talk today, today about is being comfortable in mystery. Hear me say it again. Being comfortable in mystery. The kingdom of God is a mystery. Everybody can't see the kingdom. If you have to be born again in order to see the kingdom and you have to be born of the water and the spirit to enter the kingdom, then you, you, you've got to understand there are mysterious things about the kingdom of God and this walk that we have. Jesus came preaching the kingdom and he would look at people when he preached and he would say, the kingdom of God is at hand. And if you're looking for it in the natural you don't see it. Why? It's mysterious. It's a mystery. And today what I'm after is not going to tell you that I can explain everything about the kingdom is you've got to be comfortable in understanding that he meant for this thing to be a mystery. And you need to be comfortable with what he's doing. Matter of fact, I personally think it's a, it's, it's a requirement for us to be comfortable in mystery. I, 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 that's all I'll say about that at the moment, but hear me make it a statement this way. The kingdom of God works, functions, and displays itself in mystery. 
So the kingdom of God is a mystery, and how do I embrace that mystery? Now let me try to illustrate what I want to say today in a way, and I want to make just one application. This is by no means inclusive of everything about the kingdom that there is, but here's the picture that I want to give. Let's suppose that we're on a 747 airplane and the lights come on where we're seated and the, the, the lights begin to tell us that there is severe turbulence ahead. You've heard them say a variety of things on planes. If you've flown much, buckle your seat belts, put your seat belts on, remain in your seats because there's going to be turbulence ahead. Now, we're in this 747, if you can just go with me for a moment and imagine yourself, you're on this, the sign comes on, turbulence ahead, we're over an ocean, and here we are traveling, and we realize that in, this, in my story, I'm telling you that Jesus is the pilot of this 747 we're flying on, okay? Jesus is the pilot, and the pilot comes on to explain to the people on board, you and I, what it means to be comfortable in mystery. You're on the plane. Turbulence is ahead. What's going to happen? What's going to take place? How shaky is it going to be? How rocky and how rough is the ride going to get? What's going to happen? We don't know what's happening. We just know and understand that the captain is telling us there's turbulence ahead of us and we're supposed to be comfortable. Are you with me? Stay with me just a moment. Now, this turbulence... This plane is about to go through will bring challenge to us. It will threaten us. It could bring fear to us. It could bring questions to us. So what can he say or do that would cause us to feel comfortable during this turbulence. Here's the truth. The truth is we are more safe with Jesus being the pilot in a 747 over the ocean going through turbulence than we are sitting at home in our recliner all by ourselves with nothing happening. I know some of you don't believe that, but that's true. I don't want to get sidetracked here, but I want you to understand we as a nation, we as a world, we on planet Earth are facing some turbulence. What do you mean? It's tough. The road's rocky. The, play, the, the, the things that may be ahead are not something we don't know exactly what may or may not happen. You read things and you hear things and so much is being said and, 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 and you know, people... <sighs> Oh, I'm in trouble now. I know I'm going to get in trouble. People talk about, all oh, because all this is going on, it's the end of time, it's the end of the world. And I want to quote verses to you like, The glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. If the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the water covers the sea, if you read your Bible and he says, sit at my, Father said to the Son, sit at my right hand till your enemy be made your footstool. What do you mean? Till the body of Christ puts the devil in his place. Jesus isn't returning. 
the world and what's going on in the world and what the devil's doing is not the determinate factor about the return of Christ. Read your Bible, not the journals, not the news stations. Read your Bible. See, I knew I'd get in trouble. None of that was in my notes. Turbulence ahead. I won't go there anymore. I'll just kind of leave that alone. But here's what I want you to see. We're on this 747. Turbulence is ahead. You're safer with Jesus in the turbulence than you are sitting at home. Peter must have felt that way because when they were on a boat in the storm, Peter felt safer out on the water with Jesus than he did in the boat. The only safety in the world is to be properly related to Jesus. Now, I'm saying that because here's what I want to follow that up with. That's a mystery. Most of the world doesn't believe that. Most of the world doesn't see that. Most of the world doesn't understand the security and the safety that comes in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you this. He really is a Savior. See, all of us religious people, when we hear Savior, we think, yeah, that means he saved my soul, now I get to go to heaven. Well, you're probably going to see that a little different when I'm done today. A Savior. What do you mean? He, he is a Savior, and that's true. I may interpret that word for you today in a little different way, but I'm saying to you, our world is facing turbulence. I believe there is severe turbulence ahead. But today, I want to impart to you a confidence so that you can live securely and rest in the mystery of what may be in front of us. What do you mean? Well, what is a mystery? We talk about a mystery, and there's all kinds of things I could say, but one of the things of a mystery is we've never gone this way before. That's a mystery. We've never been here. We've never seen it this way. A mystery is when things are out of control and you don't know what's happening and you're not in control. we got a lot of people who are so used to being in control that when things get out of control, they don't know how to trust in Christ. They don't know how to depend on Him. Things are just out of control. It's a mystery that I've got to learn how to be safe in his person. What do you mean? How can I be on that plane with the turbulence knowing Jesus is going to take us through this turbulence? No, he's going to take us through the storm. Know that he's going to be there. And how can I not add anything to but trust him to get us through the storm? If I'm not safe with Christ, then I'm not safe at all. The fourth thing that I would say about mystery is we've got to learn how to yield to it and not resist it. You know how many of us think we've got to know and understand and control everything going on around us? When we resist mystery, when we resist the fact that I don't have it under control, it brings fear, it brings anxiety, and a lot of other things. Now, I want to talk to you just a moment, not a long time, but just a moment about what it means to be saved. If you look at the average Christian and you talk to the average Christian and you say, you know what it means to be a saved? Yeah, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. That's what they believe saved means. I'm saved. I'm okay. I'm going to heaven. Everything is in order in my life. 
The first time the word saved is mentioned is in the Gospel of Matthew. It's a word sozo. It's an all-inclusive word. It means whole. It means all kinds of, of things more than just going to heaven. But it's when the woman who, is, who has the issue of blood touches the hem of his garment. Matter of fact, let, let me just read you a little bit of that here from Matthew 9, beginning at verse 20. It says, And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made whole. But when Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was well from that hour. Now, if you read in your margins or you study that, that out, the word there when he says, Your faith has made you a whole, the King James says, and the other, what, what he literally said to her was, Your faith has saved you. First time it's mentioned. Your faith has saved you. What do you mean? It saved her. Do you realize a woman with an issue of blood, this goes back to you. You go back and study Leviticus and what was going on in the law, and they were unclean, treated a whole certain way uh, when it was an ongoing thing. And, and, and she was sick, she was ill. You can imagine losing blood continually for this length of time. And her faith, touching the hem of his garment, saved her, it says. Everybody say saved. <laughs> the word saved, depending on where you look, 70 times if you look in the Strongs and those kinds of things and count them, if you go Google it, the word saved, and they confuse sozo with other words that, that are translated the same way, but it'll say 104 times. And here's one of the things I know. I, I have personally looked up the word and studied the word and in about 50 of those that I have chosen to look at I haven't looked at all but of the 50 that I looked at and you study the word saved not in any of the context is the context about going to heaven not a one of them there's others out there, and I'm not taking anything away. There may be something there, and I'm not. And, and I, I, I want to stop, and I want to make sure that everybody here knows and understands that I've I'm not the inclusive one on this. How many of y'all know I believe in being saved? How many of you know I believe in going to heaven? Believe in saved, believe in going to heaven. That's where dead people go. Okay? I don't know many live people. They say they want to go there, but nobody wants to go today. Now watch. I've looked at many of these verses on saved. None of them have anything that I've looked at have anything to do with heaven. They all have to do with, listen carefully, saved from myself, saved from my enemies, saved from issues, saved from governmental failure, saved from sin, saved from sickness. Every one of them that I looked at. Jesus is the Savior. Now stay with me. Remember, we're on a 747. There's turbulence ahead. We're trusting the pilot, and the pilot is Jesus who is the Savior. Everybody with me? Oh, well, well I, I thought that just meant if he's my Savior and I accept him, I get to go to heaven. It means that too, but that's not what it means in the context of Scripture everywhere. Now, what is he Savior of? Maybe he wants to save us from all of the stuff 
that is continually coming at us. What do you mean? Well, number one, oh, I, I, the Bible says he saved us from sin. Is that right? He saved us from sin. So why do we as Christians want to say we're sinners if he saved us from sin? Why do we believe or think we have to sin if he saved us from sin? Well, why do you think, Pastor? Because you keep looking at your flesh, not at him. You're not comfortable in his presence. You're comfortable in your flesh. And as long as you look at your flesh, you think that you have to sin because your flesh is flesh. There are works of the flesh just like there are works of the Spirit. Where are you going to focus, on your flesh or on the Spirit? The Spirit is a mystery. The flesh is what we see, hear, feel, taste, touch. It's our senses. Now, some of you are sitting there going, I wonder where he's going with this. I hope you go with me. I hope you don't jump out of this 747, okay? I believe with all of my heart that whatever the future holds, whatever happens on planet Earth, Whatever takes place on this planet, God wants us to walk through it with His kingdom being manifested in our lives because we are receiving a mysterious kingdom that cannot be destroyed. Nothing can stop the kingdom of God from doing what it came to planet earth to do. Well, Pastor Farley, I just don't want to be involved in all the chaos and all the ruckus and everything that's going on. He wants you to. The only alternative to that is bye, see you in heaven. What's he going to do? Oh, I don't mean to chase these rabbits. What's he going to do when he returns to earth? He's going to raise all those dead people up and bring them right back here on this earth. Help me, Lord. Let me take a little journey with you here for a moment. All of the conflict, all of the, tur the, the turmoil, all of, all of the turbulence that's going on. Do you understand that God uses conflict and circumstances to do two things? Two things He uses conflict and circumstances for. Every, con every conflict that I have gone through God has chosen for me to go through that conflict so that I might help others who may go through the same conflict I'm going through or have been through. Now that's a mystery. It's a mystery to me that he would love you so much that he would allow me to go through something, not just for me, but so that I could find the grace to help me in my time of need and be able to minister to you the same grace in abundance that he gave me in my conflict to help you in your conflict. It's amazing to me. That's a mystery. It's, it's something that's in the kingdom of God and the way he operates that, that you and I wouldn't choose to operate or function that way, but that's how he he has chosen to do that. Let me read this to you, uh, th this mystery from 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 
And, and because of time, I, I, I was going to read it in both the New King James and the Passion, but I, I just want to read this to you from the Passion Bible because I, I think you'll get a better picture of what it is he's saying. Listen carefully to this. Read along with me. All praises belong to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for He is the Father of tender mercy and the God of endless comfort. He always comes alongside us to comfort us in every suffering so that we can come alongside those who are in any painful trial. We can bring them this same comfort that God has poured out upon us. And just as we experience the abundance of Christ's own sufferings, even more of God's comfort will cascade upon us through our union with Christ. If troubles weigh us down, that just means that we will receive even more comfort to pass on to you for your deliverance. For the comfort pouring into us empowers us to bring comfort to you. And with this comfort upholding you, you can endure victoriously the same sufferings that we experience. Now our hope for you is unshakable because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in God's comforting strength. Brothers and sisters, you need to know about the severe trials we experienced while we were in western Turkey. All of the hardships we passed through crushed us beyond our ability to endure, and we were so completely overwhelmed that we were about to give up entirely. It felt like we had a death sentence written upon our hearts, and we still feel it to this day. It has taught us to lose all faith in ourselves. Now stop. Look at me. Listen to me. This suffering has taught us to lose all faith in ourselves and to place all of our trust in the God who raises the dead. Now there's a same strange thing about this mystery that God, he said, those who suffer with me shall reign with me. Do you know what I'm saying? If you don't go through suffering, you're, how are you going to reign? And some of the stuff that I'm going through, some of the stuff you're going through is not really about you and what you've done wrong. As long as you're fo focused on you and you think it's because you've done something wrong, it may be because you are doing something right and he wants to use your life and bring you something that you can share with somebody else. What are you saying? It may not be about you. Well, I thought everything was about me. That's our problem. It's a, mis it's a mystery. Here's what I'm saying to you. I experience certain things that are not even for me. They are for you. The Lord allowed me to see his comfort, to touch his comfort, to feel his comfort so that when I met you, I would have a kingdom impartation to share with you out of my own experience. I wonder why he does that. Because you experiencing his comfort is authentic. It's not a theory. It's not a theology. It's a witness. It's a testimony that if God would do something for me, I am sure he would do it for you also. Amen. See, we get so caught up that we don't see the mystery of what's going on. 
we don't understand that what he's working inside of us as in, is an eternal weight of glory. He's working something in us so that we can help and encourage somebody else to get through it. Paul talks about all of the things he went through, why he went through them, and for what purpose he went through them. It's a life-giving word that needs to be imparted. Impartation. An impartation is the ability to speak into people's lives in such a way that they are impacted. How many times have I been going through my own pity party feeling my own pain, my own discouragement, my own despair, my own situation, and my own circumstance only to get around somebody else who's going through something 10 times worse than me and they're going, God's good, isn't it good to be the servant of the Lord? I just don't know what to do without the Lord. The Lord's wonderful. I'm just having a good time in the Lord and I'm thinking, how do they do that? I've missed going to Haiti because on Sunday morning I still get up and pray for my Haitian brothers and pastors in Haiti. and We talk about what we've got and we go down there and go to church. And You know, I love, you've heard me tell this story. I love, we took this pastor down there and we were buying a lot beside a church and we got there and this pastor said, man, it's exciting. I'm really glad that we're getting this lot next door to the church. Man, look here, they don't have any place to park right here. They, they, they need that for a parking lot. We never said a word that coming Sunday morning we come to the church and we're pulling up there and you can hear the music and you can hear the singing. You understand what I'm saying going on? And, and we pull up there and he goes, well, is there anybody here? There's no cars here but us. We walked in, the church is packed, 350 people or more and they're in there just having a big time singing. Why? They don't have cars. They don't need parking lots but they come to church happy. They come to church with joy. They go through the same things we go through. And it does us good to experience those kinds of things because, you know, some of us, I mean, it's really difficult. We, 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 we have a hard time getting up and come. I don't need to go there. Get up and come to church. Why? Well, my coffee pot didn't work this morning, so I just couldn't have a cup of coffee. I would be grouchy if I went to church. Think about this for a moment. What would it be like for us to believe and to have faith that God desires to help us, to change us, to deliver us from the situations and the circumstances life could bring in order for us to be able to help somebody else. Now, here's where I want to take this, and I hope you can make this transition with me. Our transition into our relationship with Christ is a mystery. What I mean by that is I can fully understand and comprehend that when I accepted Christ, that because of the finished work that Jesus did, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. He took my sin to the cross. My sins are forgiven. When he died, I died. When he was buried, I was buried. When he was resurrected, I was resurrected with him. I now have new, newness of life. And if anybody looks at me, I have no problem saying I'm a Christian. Yes, I am in Christ. And we use the word with that sometimes saved. And, and, and th that's where we get to, and that's where most of us have stopped. But here's the mystery that we don't comprehend. You're in Christ, but Christ is also in you. See, you were created in Christ Jesus. I'll get to it in a moment in Galatians 4.19 where Paul 
was praying, I labor until Christ is formed in you. See, I can identify with being in Christ. I'm a Christian, going to heaven. I got things together. I, I'm in Christ. I'm trusting Christ. But it's a mystery for me to identify that everything Christ is, God's desire is to manifest everything Christ is in his body, which is you and me as the body of Christ, and Christ is maturing in every one of us, and all of creation is waiting for this. They're actually groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the formation of Christ in a body of believers who will allow him and who will identify with him living in me and you. And it's a mystery how he does that. And look at me. What am I saying to you? You might as well get comfortable realizing Christ wants to use you. He wants to live in you. He wants to manifest himself in you. He wants to use you to touch people that he wants to touch. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Is, am, I, am, I, am I making myself clear? I hope I am. See, I believe he can save me, impart to me, transform me, all in the same instant. But when we go through turbulence and difficult situations, we recognize how he can work in me so that I can now recognize I can help others with this. Let me ask you, do, do you all think we can become comfortable in mystery, not having it all figured out, not having it all together. Life's an adventure, and uh, Jesus wants us to have, I've, I've really tried to say everything I'm saying to get us to this point for you to catch this. Jesus really wants us to have a relationship with his heavenly Father. Jesus came to impart to you and I a working relationship with God. Jesus just didn't come and die so that you could go to heaven. The gospel didn't start in Genesis chapter 3. It started in Genesis 1 when he made man and formed man on the earth and he told man that he was to have dominion over everything on the planet of the earth. That mandate hasn't changed. He still wants man to have uh, uh, dominion over everything. Nothing is supposed to dominate you. I mean, I could go through a whole series of things and talk about what it is that's trying to dominate us. Let me ask you a question. What, what are drugs and alcohol? Wheat, barley, Corn, herbs, huh? Are they not? Guys, we're supposed to dominate that. That ain't supposed to dominate us. I don't want to get off on that. I'm not trying to preach against that. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just simply saying the mandate was that we have dominion over everything that plants, everything that grows, everything on the earth. It ain't supposed to be in charge of us. I just want y'all to know I ain't hearing enough amens. All right. Jesus is the way to the Father. 
In John chapter 14, John 14, beginning at verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have also known my Father also. From now on you will know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you love me, or if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now I want to read this to you because this is the key to what I'm trying to say today, the mystery that we're trying to get across. And I want to read this to you from the Passion Bible. Will you read along with me? Jesus explained, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes next to the Father except through union with me. To know me is to know my Father too. And from now on, from now on, from now on, you will realize that you have seen him and experienced him. Philip spoke up, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be all that we need. Jesus replied, Philip, I've been with you all this time, and you still don't know who I am. How could you ask me to show you the Father for anyone who has looked at me has seen the Father. Don't you believe that the Father is living in me and that I am living in the Father? Even my words are not my own but come from my Father. For he lives in me and performs his miracles of power through me. Believe that I live as one with my Father and that my Father lives as one with me. Or at least believe because of the multiple the mighty miracles I have done. I tell you this timeless truth. Now listen, timeless truth. The person who follows me in faith, believing in me, will do the same mighty miracles that I do, even greater miracles than these, because I go to be with my Father. For I will do whatever you ask me to do when you ask in my name, and that is how the Son will show what the Father is really like and bring glory to Him. Ask me anything in my name, and I will do it for you. This passage is about us understanding the mystery of Christ and His Father and us and our Father. When you accepted Christ and you got in Christ, you became a child of God and you are now in the Father's family. And as you mature and have relationship with your Father, you begin to act like him, talk like him, speak like him, carry his authority, carry his words, be what he is. Jesus, see, we've taken John 14 out of its context because it's not in the context. Jesus said, I am the way, and we've made Jesus the way to heaven. He is the way to heaven, but he's much more. He's also the way to the Father. Help me. 
What's our identity? Guys, isn't it a mystery? Isn't it a mystery to you for us to understand that everything Jesus was in his relationship with his Father, he was one with him. He wants us to have the same relationship. Greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. Now, I'm trying to close, and I'm going to close with a scripture here in just a moment. I am in Christ, meaning I have accepted his finished work and that he has accepted you and I into his family, into his body. We are now the family of God. We are the body of Christ. What's the importance of that? I now have a working relationship with a heavenly father. Guys, I can't overemphasize this enough. And what does this heavenly father want me to do? He wants to grow me up, mature me up, get me to the place where I reach the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Well, how does that happen? Well, it happens as you take these flights and you get in this turbulence and things start going haywire and you start feeling fear and anxiety and you start experiencing things and you start suffering certain things and you either plug into him or you wonder what's wrong with you. And once you learn to plug in with him, then you start teaching others and you say to others, you know, I went through that and I experienced that in my life and here's what God's done for me and I want to just agree with you and help you and encourage you. You're going to get through this same thing too. Why? Because we're going to become the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We're going to have Christ formed in us in search, such a way that we are mature in everything we are in our walk with Christ. I am in Christ, but I also realize Christ is in me. In Galatians chapter 4, and this is my last passage of Scripture, but in Galatians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, let me try to illustrate what I'm saying. Let me, let me before I start reading, let me just say it to you like this. When we accept Christ as our Savior and we're born again and we're born into the family of God, we're born as a babe. A babe is a babe. He, he, he's, he's everything that the Father has, but he's a babe until he grows and matures and he reaches a certain place and a certain age where he begins to behave. And I, I realize at this point in my life that, that uh, uh, every day, I was in Huntington this week, and again, I'm coming out of Walmart at 11 o'clock Thursday night, and as I'm walking out the door, some guy walks in, and he goes, Hi, Brother Farley. I don't know this guy from Adam. Nobody calls me Brother Farley. You know who he thought it was? He thought it was my daddy. Now, let me tell you something that's mystery. Wonder how mysterious it would be if we would start Rob, you look just like Jesus. You act just like Jesus. You talk just like Jesus. Jim, you, you, you got a side to you that is ex Jesus exactly. And you know what most Christians start thinking when I say stuff like that? They start going, why, I'd be afraid to say that. You know what I know about them? And about these two, you might know anything. But that's what the Father wants us to see, is Jesus in us. But it's babies growing up. Now, Galatians 4, I'm reading it in the Passion. Let me illustrate it starts. 
Galatians 4, 1. Is that where you are? Huh? That's what it says, but mine doesn't say what yours is saying right there. I'm sure the computer's wrong and my Bible's right. You're going to do the New King James. That's fine. Y'all can read along with it and just listen to me. Now, let me illustrate. As long as an heir is a minor, he's not really much different than a servant, although he's the master over all of them. One of the reasons I always said I was going to write a book on sons and servants is we don't get it. As children, we're servants. But you reach a place of maturity where you become a son and you understand. Even though you're master over everything, you're still that. Although he's master over all, for un, verse 2, for until the time appointed by the father, the child is under the domestic supervisions of the guardians of the estate. Verse 3, so it is with us. When we were juveniles, we were enslaved under the hospital spirits of the world. Verse 4, but when the time of fulfillment had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, yet... Verse 5, yet all of this was so that he would redeem and set free those held hostage to the law so that we would receive our freedom and a full legal adoption as children. And so, and, verse 6, and so that we would know that we are his true children, God released the spirit of sonship into our hearts, moving us to cry out, intimately, my father, my true father. I, I, I want you to catch this. What he's saying here is you reach a place of maturity where you realize Jesus' father is your father. The King James says, Abba, father. That means you realize that you have a relationship with the father that is now your father. Verse 7. Now we're no longer living like slaves under the law, but we enjoy being God's very own sons and daughters. And because we're His, listen to this, because we're His, we can access everything our Father has, for we are heirs because of what God has done. Before we knew God as our Father, we were unwitting servants to the powers that be, which are nothing compared to God, but now we are truly known, we truly know Him and are intimately known by Him. Why would we for, one, for a moment consider turning back to those weak and feeble principles of religion as though we were still subject to them? Let me jump over to verse 19 because this is where I want to close. Verse 19, and he says this. You are my dear children, but I agonize in spiritual labor pains once again until the anointed one will be fully formed in your hearts. <coughs> it's a mystery that God is forming in every one of our hearts father son father daughter relationship <coughs> for us to become the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ what am I saying you might as well get comfortable in it you might as well understand One child ain't like any other child. How many of you have more than one child? Let me see your hand. Are they exactly alike? In no way, shape, form, or fashion. Quit trying to make God's children 
just like you. Teach them and show them they can have a personal relationship with God until Christ is formed in me. I want Christ to be formed in me, don't you? I don't want to just be in Christ and be saved. That'll get you to heaven. That's all you need to get to heaven. But to succeed on planet earth the way he wants us to succeed and bring glory to God, Jesus came with a work that needed to be done. And then the Holy Spirit came with a work to be done. And the Holy Spirit is manifesting and conforming and abiding in us so that we can have Christ formed in us. Stand with me. I am in Christ and Christ lives in me. May be immature, may be a one year old, may be a four year old, may be a teenager. But he's going to come on to maturity. Don't you think it's time that the body of Christ mature? I do. I think it is. That we walk as sons and daughters of God. Say this with me, would you please? Dear Lord, I desire for Christ to be formed in me. I also desire for him to grow and mature and develop every stage of my life. Bring me into maturity. Allow your life to live through me. I desire to be one with you as you were one with Christ. Help me, Lord, to be comfortable in mystery. Help me to trust you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name.